Yeah. I think we can start until others can join later. Uh, hi everyone, thank you for joining uh, IEEE ISWA chapter webinar. Uh, we're glad that we have Dr. Arash Vahid Nia today to presenting the title of Monitoring and Control of Power Systems with Increasing Penetration of Renewable Energy Resources. I will go very quick uh, uh, and introduce uh, Dr. Arash and then uh, we can uh, all listen to the presentation. Dr. Arash Vahid Nia is currently a Senior Lecturer and Program Manager in the School of Engineering at RMIT University. He received his PhD in power engineering from Queensland University of Technology and was a research fellow within the power engineering group at QUT before joining RMIT. He's also a senior member of IEEE and has several years of industry experience working at power consultancy and utility firms. His research interests include system stability, wide area control, microgrids, power and energy system planning, integration of renewable energy sources, and control of renewable rich power systems. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Arash, and uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, thanks, Mayat. Hello, everyone, and uh, again, thanks for inviting me for this presentation. Uh, I hope that everybody can hear me. Uh, well, so let me just share my screen and then I'll go. Yeah. All right, so the, uh, the topic that I'm going to just talk about today is the monitoring and control of power system with increasing penetration of renewable energy resources. So, um, I know that many people are aware of the topic of renewable energy resources, but today I'm just going to mostly focus on a few important aspects of uh, the way that these renewable energy resources are impacting the power system, particularly the stability of the power system, and how we can tackle those problems uh, for, you know, which are currently we have the, these problems and the problems actually going to grow much bigger than what they are now. Now let's start with the just beginning, giving an introduction to what the uh, conventional power grid looked like. This is some, this is how the power grid looked like a few years ago when we had uh, big generators like coal-fired generators or uh, other types of generators. In Australia, they were mostly coal-fired, but uh, in other parts of the world, there were different types of uh, mostly fossil fuel-based uh, generators, and we had. Uh, from these generators, we had uh, transmission systems which were transferring power to uh, the consumers. So some of the consumers were large consumers which were fed directly through transmission networks. And then uh, we had some other customers, the majority of the customers in the distribution level. And uh, the majority of the customer were just, you know, either industrial customers or residential customers. That's how I tried to just show these customers with those, you know, the you know, lamp and uh, uh, an induction machine here. So this is how it looked like before we, we went through the changes in the last uh, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the power system is now looking like something like this. So we have uh, different types of generators. You know, we have, still we have uh, fossil fuel based synchronous generators in the system. And also we have, you know, non fossil fuel based synchronous generators as well, like the uh, uh, hydro plants. And, but we also started to see a growing share of uh, renewable based generators like wind farms. You know, either you know onshore wind farms, offshore wind farms, or different types of solar plants coming into the grid. So the mix of generator uh, generation has changed significantly, and still we had the same transmission lines. So transmission system uh, relatively remained the same, and distribution system was also the same. But the the biggest change was also in the consumer. So the consumers also started to change a lot because uh, they weren't only consumers anymore. So uh, that's how I try to show it in the, with the errors. As you can see, the uh, the consumers start to be called them prosumers. Uh, they they were just also generating power and also consuming power at the same time. So some of the households uh, started to put solar panels on their rooftop and they became both generators and consumers. And we also started to have uh, in the recent years, we started to have uh, 
smaller scale uh, renewable generators, which are connected uh, in distribution level as well. So that's why I put some of these in the middle between transmission and distribution. And at the same time, uh, another part, which is also playing a significant part in the fee, going to play a significant part in the, the future transition to renewable energy is the energy storage. So energy storage is the, either it's battery storage in households, battery storage in utility level, or uh, different types of energy storage like the uh, pumped hydro and other things which are already part of the new paradigm in the system. So this is the, the way we are moving forward. And uh, while this is very good, but uh, we also started to, started to have uh, many challenges. Uh, <clears throat> some of these challenges were initially felt in the distribution network. Uh, such as the uh, voltage problem, imbalance problems in the distribution networks. Uh, but now with the increasing penetration of uh, renewable energy resources, we start to see uh, <clears throat> much bigger challenges in the entire power system. So uh, one of the a few reasons for that was that uh, we, we didn't have much investment in the power, <clears throat> in major power stations. Uh, you know, in, in the, I'm talking about the, uh, big uh, power stations, you know, which, which provide the synchronous uh, uh, inertia for the power system in the last 10 years. We also didn't have much investment in the transmission networks in the power system. So, uh, and at the same time, we started to have many of our coal fire plants being retired. <clears throat> so, at the, with, with all these factors in, now we are we are facing a situation when the power system starts to lose a lot of its inherent inertia. So we, because the synchronous machines traditionally provided the inertia and the primary frequency control for the power system, and they were also uh, were highly reliable in a way that when we wanted them to generate, let's say, a thousand megawatt, we usually had that a thousand megawatt. Whereas uh, the main resources for the renewable energy, uh, such as wind and solar, are very intermittent, so uh, we, they're not available all the time. Now, the other problem is the uh, that we are going to face actually in the very near future is the increasing electric vehicles, uh, which will change also the pattern that the consumers are uh, consuming electricity, and. At the same time, the, the probably one of the major uh, issues as well is the lack of strong grid infrastructure in the renewable energy hotspots. And the main reason behind that is actually the infrastructure, the transmission, especially transmission infrastructure in Australia were built around the availability of the old resources like the coal fire plants uh, and majority of the transmission lines will be built around those areas, whereas the, uh, the main, uh, Places where we have uh, renewable energy, like the you know the uh, the wind corridors, uh, are not really they they don't really have uh, much infrastructure transmission infrastructure. So these are the challenges we are facing, but um, we need to see how we can actually solve or address these problems. Now, the, probably the the biggest or the main way to solve these problems is actually increasing the investment in grid infrastructure. So. If we can afford to invest as much as we can on the grid, we can solve all these problems. However, it's not really possible. So, uh, I mean, uh, we can't really do uh, invest all the money in the world in, in the grid. So we, we need to utilize the power system the best we can. And uh, we, we can also utilize the, the capabilities of the grid through uh, some advanced methods, such as uh, some uh using advanced controllers and also using better measurements in the system uh at the same time uh we still need to invest in the grid infrastructure you know we need to build storage systems uh and also uh also better engage with the customers to just better utilize the uh, the whole system and improve its uh <coughs> improve its capabilities now, the one that I'm mostly uh, focusing on today is uh, the uh, utilize, better utilization of the capacity or capabilities of the grid through uh, advanced measurement and control. So this is the topic that I'm uh, going to talk uh, tonight, actually. Now, when we talked about the intermittency of the renewable energy resources, so we are all aware of that, you know, we, we don't have... Uh, Sun available all the time. At the same time, we don't have uh, wind blowing every you know every second. 
uh, but the intermittency could be also quite severe in some cases when in very short periods of time, like let's say within less than five minutes, uh, we will have significant changes in the generation of these solar plants or wind farms. So, so th these are two examples of Australian wind farms and uh, solar farms, as you can see the, the changes. These are five minute intervals and you can see the uh, changes could be significant. Even the forecast uh, is not capable to properly uh, forecast those, you know, those changes, those short term changes. And these short term changes are quite important because uh, they will be determining uh, factors in uh, maintaining the stability of the system. So we really need to uh, ensure the system remains stable within those short periods of time. Now, when I go to the uh, <clears throat> to talk about the uh, better controls, the key element in, in providing better control in various part of the system is actually having better measurement. So uh, historically in, in general power system, we, we had some uh, measurements in different parts of the network. Usually in the transmission network, we provided those measurements through the SCADA or uh, just some local measurements uh, for our controllers. Now, the, the way that we have been uh, working recently on to Im improving these uh, control designs is to rely on more remote measurements or rely mostly on measurements which are provided with uh, uh, through, through remote measurements through such devices such as phaser measurement units or PMUs. So these devices are capable of providing high sampling rate uh, measurements of voltage and uh, current from across the network, and uh, we can just uh, have very high frequency uh, sampling of the voltage, and that would be useful in uh, designing the controller and having a controller which relies on those measurements. So I will go through that uh, in uh, future slides, but this is the, the graph that I show here, just shows the comparison between the control design based on local measurements and control design based on uh, based on the uh, phaser measurements or wide area control, as we call it. Now, the big difference here is sometimes with local measurements, we may not be able to observe uh, or uh, observe all of the uh, dynamics in the system. Sometimes we would be only restricted to, to observing the local dynamics and we won't be able to see all the dynamics in the system. So we won't be able to provide control mechanisms to those dynamics which are uh, of uh, interest. So one example for that would be some very low frequency modes in the system, which are uh, usually very low damped and uh, not very well damped. So uh, we won't be able to observe those frequencies and we won't be able to control them properly if we don't have proper measurement across the network. The other aspect of, uh, the, I mean, uh, designing controllers actually uh, to just how we can model the system. So let's assume that if we want to design a controller for a, a, a part of the network and we have the measurement across different parts of it, from, let's say from all over the network, if we want to use all that information to design the control, the control would be very, very complex and uh, it, it won't be very feasible actually. Now, in order to do that, we uh, mainly rely on uh, models which uh, only represent the desired uh, desired dynamics. So we mainly rely on the control uh, on on the models which we call them reduced models, and these models uh, can only represent the models that we we are interested in. That and by by using these models, we uh, reduce the uh, complexity of the whole system. At the same time, we also reduce, uh, I mean, reduce the computational burden. At the same time, we ensure that in our control design, we don't consider those unnecessary dynamics. And uh, this this type of uh, control design has been uh, using control engineering for many years. But uh, and uh, but in power systems, we also need to adapt it, especially if we are talking about if we are designing the controllers which uh, would be taking into account all the uh, measurements across the from across the network. Then uh, the uh, you know the, the whole model 
which is, you know, let's say, assume that we are talking about the Australian model, Australian power system, we can't consider the whole system and we need to just uh, use a simplified model which represents that whole system to design the controller. And the same thing also applies for uh, <coughs> inverters as well, which will be the uh, probably the future of power generation in uh, whole power systems. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the details that we need in designing the controller really depends on the dynamics of interest. For example, if you want to just uh, design a controller for, let's say, a local controller for an inverter, or if you want to design a local controller for a synchronous machine, we just mainly rely on the uh, very simplified model of those uh, elements uh, which only represent those dynamics that we are interested in, and we can just easily des design the controllers for that. Uh, however, when it comes to, as I mentioned, when it comes to <clears throat> it comes to the uh, large power systems, uh, we can still use the same concept, and we can still uh, de develop the controller based on a very simplified and reduced model, which represents only those dynamics that we are interested. Now, uh, if we have a very much detailed model, especially uh, especially when it comes to inverters, because uh, their model could be very complex, if we include all the switching models, then designing controller would be pretty much uh, impossible. It, it would be possible, but uh, the complexity would be too much and uh, the controllers may not be actually uh, efficient controllers. Now, I'm not talking about the local controllers here. We are talking about the controllers will be used to uh, control the dynamics across the, the, the network. So these are, we're not talking about very local controllers here. Now, if you want to, uh, you know, improve the, I mean, design the controllers, we can rely on the available assets in the network. So, uh, for example, in Australia, we have many, many uh, different, you know, uh, assets like yeah, SVCs, Statcoms, uh, or HVDC links, which they can be used to stabilize the system if they are properly controlled. So, if you have proper control on these devices, uh, based on the measurements from across the network. We can use these devices to ensure the system is stabilized, and uh, that will also ensure that we can utilize the spare capacity of the system. So, for example, in uh, many cases, some of our transmission links are transmission, uh, sorry, the stability limited because, uh, because of many factors. Uh, and if we can utilize these advanced controllers, the stability limit of those, you know, those transmission lines could be increased. And it could be uh, a, a real factor in increasing the uh, system stability and also ensuring the system remains uh, operational during high penetration of renewable energy resources. Because when the system has uh, operated in a situation when we have less synchronous machine and less inertia, uh, the system is more susceptible to um, any any disturbances. So, if we have better control on uh, on the different assets in the network, we can ensure we can run the system uh, with low low amount of inertia and with high penetration of uh, renewable energy resources like wind farms and solar farms. Now, one way, as I mentioned, one way to actually achieve the better control in the system is to ensure we can get the uh, proper model, which represents only the dynamics that we are interested in. Now, this is a case that we wanted to uh, control the inter-area dynamics in the power system using the SVCs and HVDC links in the system. So, uh, in order to... Uh, to design the controller because the controller would be relying on the measurements from different parts of the network. Assuming that we are talking about Australian network, the measurements would be coming from uh, from North Queensland down to South Australia. So it's it's a, it's a vast country, and uh, the in order to better utilize these measurements, we need to develop these models, which only represents those inter-area dynamics that uh, we were interested. In. So by, by providing a sort of dynamic aggregated model, so and this is, as I mentioned, dynamic because it will change all the time, uh, we can just 
find a space a state space model, a nonlinear model which represents the whole system, but only the states and dynamics that we are interested. And in this case, uh, we just did uh, this study on uh, the Australian system, and uh, we just tried to use the available SVCs in the Australian systems to try to uh, stabilize the system. And our main focus at the time was to stabilize the Queensland New South Wales interlink. So uh, this this uh, this particular uh, uh, interconnector uh, was stability limited for uh, probably I think half half the time to, throughout the year. So uh, the operators weren't able to uh, operate this link with the you know with 100% capacity because of the stability limit. So by applying these type of controllers, we were not only able to stabilize the system in the event of fault, but also we would be able to increase that uh, transient uh, transient capacity of that transmission line, uh, which was really essential, especially as I mentioned during the time when we have uh, low inertia in the system. Now for Developing the uh, dynamic models, we were relying on the uh, phaser measurement units. So the phaser measurement units across the network were fed into the uh, reduce model that we have developed. And that reduce model uh, relied on the Kalman filter based state estimator to estimate the, uh, the system states or estimate the system dynamics that we were interested. So in this case, we were interested in those inter-area dynamics between Queensland and New South Wales particularly. And uh, using this Kalman uh, estimator, we were able to, and also the PMU measurements, we were able to uh, obtain those states. And by using that, we uh, applied on the uh, first level, we applied it on the simplified Australian model. And we we got very promising results, and uh, we saw that we could increase the transfer capacity by a significant margin. So you could see that without the controller, the capacity was uh, for the case that we studied was around 500 megawatt, but with the controller, the capacity increased to 650 megawatt. So that was a significant increase for that specific case, and it showed that. But just uh, and this was only utilizing two. Uh, two main SVCs in Queensland and New South Wales. A and it shows the potential of how these controllers could be effective in improving the, uh, you know, improving the system capacity and also e effectively the efficiency of the system. Now, we also just use the full Australian model as well, just to see how uh, uh, that controller will work, and we just only utilized one SVC in New South Wales as well. And uh, we just tried the same sort of cont controller, and uh, that was also quite uh, helpful in, in improving the system stability. In this case, we just uh, compared our benchmark based on the system critical clearing time, and it showed that the controller was capable of improving that critical clearing time. Uh, one of the problems that we faced uh, in that specific scenario was that the, uh, the, the, the reactive capacity of the uh, city SVC was a bit low. So then we proposed that if we increase that reactive capacity to, to the same as the capacitive capacity, the capacitive, uh, you know, that, that SVC was plus 300 megawatt, megawatt minus 100 megawatt. So, uh, and we said, okay, if we make it plus minus 300 megawatt, that would be uh, further uh, beneficial, and that would really, really incre increase that capability of that uh, SVC in this type of controller. So, I mean, by this type of uh, control, we can see we can also find the places that uh, could be potential uh, investments, good investments for improving the system stability. Uh, for you know, for the conditions that we will be facing in the future. Now, the other application of the uh, phaser measurements units or measurements across the network, let's call it wide area measurement, is uh, identifying or estimating the characteristic of the characteristics of the load. So, this was really helpful uh, in a study that we did uh, to identify uh, the some sort of dynamic models uh, 
to represent the dynamically changing nature of the loads in different parts of the network. So by, by doing that, we were able to just uh, develop a adaptive controller, which would be then used uh, in the uh, in the same type of uh, SVC or other type of controller or H, you know, HVDC or SVCs in the network to uh, improve the system stability. But at the same time, because we were having better information from the load, uh, that adaptive type of the controller was able to further improve the system uh, stability because we always had better information from the load. And we uh, didn't really need to rely on significant number of PMUs in this case. So the same number of PMUs which were providing the control signals were able to uh, give us a good estimation of the load dynamics and uh, that would be really helpful to further improve the uh, capacity of the controller. The other aspect that we tried to use uh, using these type of controller was to use uh, wide area control on distributed generation systems. So uh, we relied on the, you know, the distributed generation systems in, uh, in distribution networks, uh, assuming that the many households would have PVs and battery st energy storage systems. So we applied this similar concept on uh, these type of control, this type of, uh, uh, sorry, this, this type of uh, customers. <clears throat> and uh, this also showed that, uh, you know, th this type of control based on measurement has the capacity capability to really significantly improve the uh, the system stability as well. If we can coordinate uh, the, you know, the outputs PV, uh, of the PVs and batteries in even in the households, uh, although there are lots of criteria that we need to satisfy, we need to ensure that the, the you know, none of the voltages in the distribution levels are violated, or all, you know, the, we also need a lot of uh, infrastructure for. <clears throat> For measurement and also for uh, for 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 communication. However, if we can have a sort of smart uh, power systems in the future, this type of controller would be really really capable in ensuring the whole system remains stable. Because, and uh, essentially, it doesn't really require a lot of telecommunication infrastructure. Because uh, what we only need is. Uh, a signal from uh, PMUs from the network, and that signal would be uh, sent just to the uh, to the distribution level households. Uh, that could be through uh, NBN or through other methods, and that uh, and because it's a one-sided signal, so it will the consumers only will receive a signal from uh, from the controller, and they don't need to. Uh, send back any signal, so it will be one-sided, and that is possible to uh, to help to stabilize the system in the situation that the system really needs it. So, and this is a, a really potential in the future because uh, we might be facing a, a situation that the system might might be facing blackouts or uh, stability issues, and by utilizing the capabilities in distribution networks and the customers, we 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 would be able to avoid such such uh, situations. Now, the other aspect that uh, I'm going to touch on on uh, today is actually the uh, how we can better integrate the uh, the renewable energy sources, which are mainly fed to the system three inverters. Now. Uh, we face a lot of, you know, uh, with, with, the in, uh, with the significant in, uh, integration of renewable energy resources, particularly in uh, high voltage systems. I'm not talking about the distribution level. Uh, the we, we have uh, some uh, significant issues because of the uh, quality of the voltage source, which these networks are connected. These uh, generate these inverters are connected to uh, the. Uh, you know, majority of the inverters are designed by assuming that we have a perfect voltage source, and uh, we can generate the, uh, you know, we can we can use that perfect voltage source to uh, provide the reference signal for our controllers, you know, for uh, for for I and V controllers, and all of these are relying on a very important. Uh, 
element, which is the PLL. So PLL provides that uh, the, the reference points for these uh, controllers inside the inverters. But all of that relies on the fact that the voltage at the uh, the point of connection is uh, is is a, of very good quality. Now that's not going to be the case in future because uh, if we are losing lots of uh, our voltage sources like our synchronous generators, we won't be having a perfect voltage source uh, in the terminals, particularly if the uh, inverters or the renewable energy sources are far from the uh, strong points in the grid. So if we are dealing with the weak uh, connection points in the grid, uh, these problems are going to be uh, more significant in the future. Now, as I mentioned, if we have a uh, you know very perfect grid with very good uh, reference signal, the PLL would perfectly work and we won't have any issue. But if in the case that we are dealing with a weak grid, uh, that's not going to be the case, and uh, PLL may not be able to follow that uh, reference. It will follow the reference sig signal, but we might have frequency oscillations, and that would create uh, stability issues for the inverters themselves. And that's something that we can actually, uh, we need to really solve for future grids when we will be dealing uh, uh, when we will be dealing with a very weak grid which doesn't have lots of. Uh, voltage support from the synchronous machines. Now, <clears throat> so this is uh, another uh, diagram that I showed that the uh, with the in increasing the line impedances, the uh, PLL becomes uh, further unstable. So it, it it's it it becomes close to instability, and that's a concern that we need to really tackle. Now, in order to just uh, you know address this issue, we we try to just develop a, a controller which also relies on the reduced order model and also uh, Kalman filters uh, for better estimation uh, to see how we can address that problem of having a good voltage or ref good reference point. And uh, we just uh, developed that model using a very simplified case with just uh, with two uh, two synchronous machines and uh, assuming that we have multiple inverters uh, just acting as current source for us. And uh, we have observed that the uh, the oscillation between the machines or the modes between the machines, uh, you know, they could be. Uh, interior modes or even local modes, they could affect the inverter PLL. So uh, that means that if we have any oscillation in the system, that would go to the inverters and that would imp impact their capability of providing that good reference point for the uh, inverter controllers. Uh, now, the other uh, fact is the inverter really do not impact the machine, so any dynamic in the inverter usually doesn't propagate to the machines. Uh, and that's that, that's actually a good sign in a way that we don't have that much of uh, coupling between the inverter modes and the machine modes, uh, whereas the machine modes will really impact the inverter modes. Now this is going to be a problem because uh, many of the controllers have in in the in the old power system were designed specifically for specific frequencies. Now we had uh, some uh, some controller which were designed for let's say uh, local modes. So we had some controller designed for low frequency inter area modes in the range of you know 0.5 to one hertz. But now when we are dealing with the system which is dynamically changing, that means that we don't have a, a base. Uh, uh, rotating inertia all the time, that uh, you know the inertia will be different across different po points of the system. So that means the uh, the modes that we'll be dealing in the system are going to change, and uh, we are seeing lots of modes in the range, you know, lots of uh, oscillation modes in the range of five to ten hertz. And because they are changing, it's not easy to design some sort of permanent controller for them. So we will need some. Uh, adaptive controller to tackle those uh, oscillations in the system, which because they will also impact the inverters. Now, uh, in order to just uh, 
solve that problem, we initially started by developing some uh, LQR controller for the inverter. So that was helpful in uh, suppressing the interactions between the inter inverters. And at the same time, we uh, try to just create this, uh, create a, a good reference point for the inverters by using the Kalman filter. So the instead of inverters relying on the their terminal voltage, we would be creating a sort of uh, a reference point for these inverters, which would be based on the measurements across different parts of the network. And those measurements will be then fed into the uh, the inverters in different inverters in the network. So, uh, however, <clears throat> there is a problem with that, uh, you know, because of the phasor difference between the terminal voltage of the inverter and the voltage that we see from the, uh, you know, from from a further away, away point from the terminal. Uh, we need to find a compromise to to ensure that the inverters do not become uh, unstable. So that's the, uh, the the thing that the Kalman filter does. So it creates the uh, reference point, it estimates the reference points, and compensates that reference points, and it feeds to uh, the inverter to you know to to ensure that the inverters <clears throat> uh, follow that good reference point. And they don't uh, be just dis, uh, distorted with the uh, weak signal or weak reference of the terminal voltage. Now we can also so by this type of control we can further uh, expand the controller that I mentioned with the uh, dynamic aggregation, and we can then uh, uh, you know develop an aggregated model or equivalent model for both for both the inverters and synchronous machines and by doing that we can then uh, apply this similar type of controller that I mentioned uh, in the previous uh, slides uh, on the mix uh, on the mix of in inverters and synchronous machines and uh, we can use these type of control like the energy function based controllers uh, to uh, to improve the system stability just through the inverters. So we can use the inverter signals uh, with these controllers to further stabilize the system if we need. So uh, this type of control will be really uh, effective in stabilizing the system. Now we further expanded this uh, study on, again, a, a bit a simple case uh, I'm showing here, just the three, uh, three inverters uh, which are almost in parallel, but there is a quite bit of impedance between these uh, three different inverters. These three are uh, representing three different, let's say, renewable energy resources. And the point of the, uh, you know, because of the high impedance, uh, their voltage source or their terminal voltage is can be considered as the weak uh, connection point. And uh, if we have oscillations in the uh, grid because of any modes in the system, those oscillations would also go, uh, they will show themselves in the inverters and uh, that would co could cause potentially problems for the inverters and they, that could lead into desynchronization of those inverters. Now, as I mentioned, we uh, developed a controller based on the phasor measurement units, which rely on the measurements across different parts of network that goes through the Kalman filter and that Kalman filter provides the stable reference points for the PLL and the PLL then feeds into the LQR and we uh, then have the PWM signals uh, going through the inverter and uh, the inverter provides the uh, signal to the grid. And we have done some, uh, I'm not going through the state space model, but then uh, this is just the mechanism of the Kalman filter. So the Kalman filter uh, relies on the prediction and updating of the states based on the measurements and the reduced model that we developed for that uh, inverter as well. So we, we use the reduced model for the inverter and uh, based on this Kalman filter, which relies on the measurement, we get the uh, reference points uh, for the uh, PLL. Now here, we, this is the results for uh, two types of controllers. So on the left-hand side, we have the PIDQ controller, 
and the right hand is the Kalman filter with the LQR. So here we injected a, a sort of distortion to the grid voltage, and you see the, these distortions uh, will appear in the inverter frequency, angle, and voltage. Whereas with the Kalman filter and LQR, because we relied on those external voltages which were which did not have that much of uh, distortion, we were able to suppress those uh, oscillations in the uh, in the you know frequency, angle, and voltage signals of the inverters, and this can significantly improve the stability of these uh, inverters. And this is just the uh, uh, another plot showing the PLL error, which shows that the error in the Kalman filter. Uh, with the LQR is almost zero, whereas we have that error happening in the uh, PID QTOP controller. So just having the final conclusion, some some remarks, and uh, the probably the biggest takeaway uh, has been that the, we can rely on the measurements in different parts of network, and they can develop the controllers based on those measurements, which can significantly uh, improve the system stability and efficiency of the system, because we would be utilizing the system more efficiently. We, we won't need significantly more investment. Now, the, the control, these controllers can be applied on various system components. They could be on distribution level. They could be on transmission level from inverters and uh, the other elements that I mentioned. The, uh, you know, the, I believe that the key, key for the future of these advanced controllers, the measurements and the related communication infrastructure, which is still, uh, we are, I believe, a bit lacking in that, that area. We don't have a lot of uh, measurements in different parts of the network, and the communication, related communication infrastructure, is not that extensive. And uh, now the if we have also better con con consumer engagement, we can further expand these type of controller to the consumer level, uh, and uh, we can utilize. The uh, consumers, you know, they could be consumer loads, could, could be consumer uh, PV generation or battery storage systems in the household that could be utilized in the event that we need. And that would be, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, that could be really uh, essential in the future of the grid when uh, we may not have really the, those uh, primary uh, support from uh, main synchronous machines, and we would be uh, needing those uh, help from every part of the network as we can get. And that's it. Thank you very much for uh, attending to tonight's presentation. I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you, Dr. Arash, for a fantastic and informative presentation. Um, any question from the attendees, please? We can ask Dr. Arash now. Uh, hello, may I? Hello, uh, may I? Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Arash, for the great uh, presentation. Unfortunately, I myself had some connectivity issues uh, at the beginning of the talk. I joined late, so uh, I'm I'm not sure whether you covered it in the earlier part of your talk, but my question is mainly about the Kalman filter. So, uh, can you please elaborate why Kalman filter is required and generally how it helps for improving the controllability or the outcome of your control uh, in controlling the inverters? Thank you. Thanks, Farad, for the. Very good uh, question. So, I mean, the Kalman filter is, is one way. I'm not saying this is the only way, but uh, in this, let's let me go. So, this is actually the Kalman filter. So, uh, when we're talking about when we we are, we want to estimate the, uh, so the whole idea was to find the the model which represents it, the dynamics that we are interested. In. And to find those dynamics, uh, we found that using a Kalman filter, a Kalman estimator would be, I mean, integrating the Kalman estimator with a reduced model would be the perfect way because then we will have both the reduced model 
and also the measurements coming from a single model. So the Kalman filter will combine all of them. The, the measurements coming from the network, you know, from let's say from the PMUs, and also the model that we have developed as the reduced model together, and that would give us a very good estimate from different states uh, of the system. We are talking about the, uh, let's say the, uh, the, the, the system states that we are really interested. So this Kalman filter really gives us all those estimates, uh, the, those states, and we can use them in the, uh, in a control design. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thanks. Uh, but may I have also a follow up question on that? With this Kalman filter, generally my understanding is that the system looks over a period of the discrete measurements of the system mm -hmm. and then tries to use that data to, as you said, to find that state values of the system in a more accurate way. Generally, what is the time? What, what is the that window of observing? So what I want to know is that can it affect can that delay affect the accuracy of the estimation, especially if the system status is going to change, like load change or any continuous changes? Or no, it's generally fast enough and it won't have any effect. So uh, generally speaking, the uh, it totally depends on the frequency of the measurement that we have. So if we rely on the PMUs, PMUs usually have the uh, sampling frequency of uh, they have higher sampling frequency, but the uh, the data is sent with the sampling of either 50 hertz or 100 hertz. So we have, you know, around, you know, in the, in the lowest case, we have 20 milliseconds between each samples. And uh, those samples, I mean, 20 milliseconds is, uh, you know, if usually in, in the uh, transmission, you know, the, the data transmission, we, we I, I wouldn't expect to have more than, uh, 50 milliseconds or more than that uh, in the you know in, in the delay. Uh, so 50 milliseconds, even 100 milliseconds could impact and uh, you know could, could impact our dyna you know dynamic estimation. And that uh, you know that that will depend on the dynamics that we are dealing with. So for this specific case, we were interested in the frequencies of around one hertz. So for the frequencies of around one hertz, those modes, uh, the you know the uh, delay of up to hundred to two hundred millisecond wasn't really impacting much because it was much below than the you know the period of that uh, dynamic that we were expecting. But if you are if you are going to use it for uh, and this is what we observed in the uh, case of the inverters when we we saw higher frequency, let's let's say five to ten hertz, those delays could be really significant. So we need to really reduce those delays. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I may have another question as well, but uh, let's go with the other attendees and then uh, I may come back. Thanks. Thank you, Farhat. Um, any more questions from attendees? Uh, oh, I have a question, uh, Arash. Yeah. As you said, with increasing uh, renewable energy resources, and especially we know that most of them inverter-based generations, uh, we know that uh, the system strength is lower and with a lower inertia and lower uh, short circuit uh, ratio. And as you touched up that, uh, with the, the inverters that we have, we get issues, especially with the PLL, which they are uh, grid following inverters. Uh, have you looked at the grid forming inverters and uh, as an option to uh, to solve the issues that uh, grid following inverters they have? Uh, uh, thanks, Wade, for actually a very good question. I think the uh, grid forming inverter will, would avoid these problems that I mentioned. So this problem is actually mainly for the grid following inverters. And uh, here we, we just try to solve a problem that we saw. I mean, grid forming inverters wouldn't have this problem, but they will have their own other problems. Uh, uh, but in terms of the uh, grid following inverters, I think the uh, we, we, we looked into the system, we saw that majority of the inverters are grid following inverters at the moment. So, uh, and the, our main goal was to try to use already available assets in the system. To ensure that you know not not going through the changing of all these inverters to something else, but just to provide some sort of additional controller uh, on the available uh, grid following inverters to see how they will work. Great, great, great job. 
any more questions? Uh, if not, Farhat, I think you had another question. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my my other question is mainly about some of those results which you were comparing, especially mm -hmm. one of the uh, results which you showed on the left hand side. It was the PI uh, DQ based control, mm -hmm. and on the right hand side it was the LQR and Kalman filter. So, uh, so the, the, the one question I have is that with the PI and DQ, it's obvious that we are doing the three phase inverter analysis in the DQ mode. Uh, how did you do that with the Cal with the LQR and Kalman filter? Did you also do it in uh, DQ frame, or were you doing that in ABC frame, like uh, uh, instantaneous? No, no, we, we use them in alpha beta frame. So okay. yeah. yeah, so so that, yeah, that's yeah, how. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, th that's how it it works. So it was a bit different. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. If there is no more question, we have Dr. Adnan. He wanted to have some words for closing this session. Thank you. Dr. Adnan. Um, thanks, Mogis, for hosting the session. Thanks, Arash. It's really nice presentation. And uh, today was the last monthly app, uh, webinar for this year. And uh, uh, I being the chair of uh, ISWS section, I really appreciate uh, the involvement of all the team members and making it successful. Uh, it's very hard doing uh, on monthly fre frequency, but uh, with all the team efforts and collaboration, we have made it possible and uh, I really appreciate all the efforts. Uh, with that being said, um, uh, I am moving to Saudi Arabia to join a research organization and my flight is actually after two weeks and uh, so and uh, we have elected our next uh, ISWA chapter pre uh, chair who is uh, Dr. Moyed and uh, I wish him best of luck for the next year endeavors and uh, I am more than happy to collaborate uh, while I, I will be based in Middle East and Saudi Arabia and uh, I really thank you so much and have a great holidays and uh, great festive season everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adnan. Uh, it's a big miss for us, but uh, I wish the best for you and your future career. And uh, thank you, Dr. Arash, again for presenting. Fantastic uh, thank presentation. Much. Thank you as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.